Yes, Mary, you've got in, you've got Paul Shaw. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Minahan. I'm a member of the Midtour Brigade Commemoration Committee. Although I live in Cork, I'm a native of Corfin and County Clare. I'm uh, very honoured to have been asked by Clare County Council, Clare County Library, to uh, deliver this lecture as part of History Week, Shakhtar Nostara, um, and the Decade of Centenaries. So what I'm going to speak to you about for the next hour or so is the opening phases of the Civil War in Clare, and specifically the role that was played by the Union Workhouse in Corfin during July of 1922, uh, where, when during that period it became the center of operations and the divisional headquarters of the first Western division of the anti-treaty IRA, a role that ultimately resulted in that building being destroyed on the 25th of July, 1922. So uh, what I'm going to cover uh, is as follows. Uh, what, first of all, I want to talk about what was the First Western Division and how that fit in with the overall structure of the IRA. I'm going to speak briefly about the split, and I'm conscious that there is potentially a mixed audience here, so I need to spend a little time just explaining uh, about the two opposing sides in the Irish Civil War in 1922 and 1923. I want to speak about the leadership of the anti-treaty First Western Division. Uh, and just hone in on a few of the uh, senior characters in that division. I want to speak in general about the occupation of barracks from the uh, British Army and from the RIC that occurred during the first half of 1922. I want to speak about Clare and the wider context of the Civil War. So we're going to be obviously concentrating on events in, mainly in Corifin uh, during 19, July 1922, but it's important to put that in the context of what was happening elsewhere in Ireland, and in particular uh, east of Clare and Limerick during that month. I'm going to speak, of course, about the Union Workhouse itself uh, and its role as the IRA Divisional Headquarters and what it looked like and how it functioned and what its main elements of operation were, and ultimately its evacuation, destruction and the aftermath. So first of all, what was the First Western Division? Well, to understand this, I, I want to speak about the structure of the IRA uh, first during the War of Independence and how that changed during the Civil War. So the basic unit of the IRA was the company is approximated to a, a parish. On average, you would have had about 45 or 50 people per company. Uh, they were usually given a letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, but of course, some companies would have been significantly smaller, comprising 10 or 12 men. In other cases, it would have been significantly greater with well over 100 men, such as Ennis, for instance. So typically, again, you would have had eight or 10 companies in a battalion. Battalions were usually given numbers, the first, second, third, fourth, et cetera. The diagram here is purely illustrative. And a battalion would have comprised about 350 or 400 men, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger. And you had, again, uh, four, five, or six battalions in a brigade. The mid Clare Brigade, for instance, had, uh, for most of the Civil War, had five uh, battalions in, in January 1921. Uh, 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 it had six battalions, uh, and uh, then you would have had two or more brigades, as you would have had uh, during most of the, of the War of Independence, the brigade was the largest unit under general headquarters. However, towards the end of the War of Independence, uh, a divisions attempts were made to introduce a, a division structure into the IRA. And so you would have had two or more brigades as part of a division. Now, these attempts at introducing a division structure into the IRA met with varying levels of success across Ireland and no level of success at all in Clare. Uh, even though you know, I have read varying accounts of this in relation to when the first Western division that Clare would have come under when that came into existence. Uh, I'm fairly satisfied that that division did not come into existence uh, for any uh, realistic intents or purposes until about October of 1922, so after the truce and after the War of Independence had ended. So when it was created, the OC of the First Western Division uh, was uh, a man by the name of Michael Brennan, uh, Major General Michael Brennan. 
Now, Michael Brennan was one of three brothers who were very prominent, in particular in East Clare, throughout the entire struggle for independence and during the war of, uh, and during the war of independence. His brother Patrick was the OC of the East Clare Brigade. There was another senior officer, Austin Brennan, also one of the three brothers. Michael himself was a TD, uh, and he was, uh, in October, uh, he was OC of the 1st Western Division. And at this stage, we had only one 1st Western Division. It was made up of the army that had fought uh, in the War of Independence. It was the same combined army. There was no split at this stage. Its numbers would have been swelled as well quite significantly, in fact, by some people who are, in, in quite a derogatory term, often referred, as the truth, referred to as the true Salers, people who joined the IRA after the truce period. Uh, and the first, uh, the first uh, Western Division uh, also had uh, uh, a vice OC, and that vice OC was uh, Frank Barrett. And Frank Barrett came from another prominent Republican family, uh, mainly, uh, mainly in the Midclair Brigade area. And these were uh, a number of brothers that also included uh, Joseph Barrett. Uh, Frank Barrett was OC of the Midclair Brigade, and uh, he became vice OC of the 1st Western Division, in, in, uh, again, which came into existence about October 1922. So the uh, split occurred in 1920, in, 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 began in December 1920, 1921, uh, and accelerated during 1922. And the issue was the treaty which was signed in December of 1921. And this treaty conferred dominion status on Ireland and dominion status was defined as being similar to the form of self-government enjoyed uh, by other dominions and specifically Canada. It required that uh, the uh, members of Dáil Éireann, for instance, and other office holders would take an oath of loyalty to the king. It conferred in Ireland a form of a significant form of self-government and Ireland was to have its own constitution not yet written. Britain retained control of the treaty ports. Uh, these were ports specifically retain, retained uh, by the Royal Navy and also with a provision that they could extend their possessions uh, of various other ports and infrastructure in the event of there being a war in the future. Northern Ireland was a state that, already, that had already come into existence uh, and Northern Ireland was to be given an opportunity to join with the uh, the Irish Free State, as it was to be called, this new uh, state with dominion status, it was to be given an opportunity to join in with that state. And if it chose not to, and ultimately, of course, it did choose not to, then a boundary commission was to be established that was going to determine border between the two states. There were some issues with this treaty, to say the least. Not least of all was that the definition of a dominion was not clear. Uh, this was something that Lloyd George himself admitted. Uh, and during the uh, debate on the Irish Treaty in the House of Commons, he actually referred, he actually answered, he was asked a question specifically what dominion status meant, and his answer was that it is difficult and dangerous to give a definition. It is something that has never been defined by an act of parliament, and yet it works perfectly. All we can say is that whatever measure of freedom dominion status gives to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or South Africa, that will be extended to Ireland. And the definition uh, of a, a dominion, even though it didn't exist, uh, did change, of course, in 1931 uh, with the Statute of Westminster. But up until 1931 and during the period uh, covered by this lecture, uh, there was a fair degree of uncertainty. And in particular, it was clear that dominion status did give legislative supremacy uh, over quite a number of areas to the parliament in, in Westminster in 1931, of course, that changed and dominion status uh, became uh, quite different and gave much greater levels of dependence to dominions. So the debate on the treaty uh, uh, occurred during December and January, December 1921 and January of 1922 in Dáil Éireann. And the, some, some of the prominent proponents of the treaty were, of course, Ar of course Arthur Griffith, uh, pictures here in back in Ennis, just a few weeks before his death, and Michael Collins uh, and others. And there were two large, there were two principal arguments in favour of the treaty. 
Uh, the first was that it was the best deal that Ireland could get, given the military situation. And we know that Michael Collins did have some concerns regarding the ability of the IRA to continue the fight against, uh, against the British. And the second, which was articulated by Michael Collins himself, uh, was that whilst this didn't give the full freedom that Ireland had, uh, had desired, that it gave Ireland the freedom to achieve that freedom at some stage in the future. And that was quite a convincing argument for many. Opponents of the treaty made, uh, uh, also made convincing arguments. Uh, one of those was, well, why are we accepting uh, a status within the British Empire that is completely different to what we have already? So most of the people who were fighting in the War of Independence didn't view that they were fighting to gain something. They took the view that they were fighting to retain something. They were fighting to retain the Republic that had been declared in 1916 uh, and that uh, fell under the government of Dáil Éireann. And but they saw this as something of a betrayal, that, uh, but instead what was happening was we were giving up that republic and we were accepting a much lesser, lesser status of dominion uh, and with an oath of loyalty to the crown. And Cathleen O'Callaghan uh, summed this up quite well during the Dáil debates and saying that now what have all these hundreds of years of struggle been for? What has it been about? What has, been the, what has been the agony and the sorrow for? Why was my husband murdered? Why am I a widow? Why uh, was it that I should come here and give my vote for a treaty that puts Ireland within the British Empire? Was it that I should take an, uh, was it that I should take an oath to be a faithful citizen of the British Empire? And Catherine O'Callaghan, of course, was a wife of Michael O'Callaghan, who was murdered by the British. She was mayor of Limerick and was shot in front of her. So we can see some of the strength of feeling on both sides with regard to this issue. So as uh, 1922, the, the treaty was ratified ultimately by Dáil Éireann and later by what was called the House of Commons of Southern Ireland, which had to meet for that purpose because it required ratification by that body, specifically under, under the Treaty and the Government of Ireland Act. So the, the, there was a split in Dáil Éireann, the anti-treaty faction withdrew from Dáil Éireann, the pro-treaty faction uh, ratified the treaty and they also convened in a modified form as the House of Commons of Southern Ireland uh, to effect that ratification. Um, and once that happened, uh, a very significant split ruptured across various Republican organisations, including the IRA. And that split was reflected in Clare. And during the spring of 1922, two first Western divisions began to emerge one under Michael Brennan, which was the pro-treaty IRA or the pro-treaty army, the other, and we'll speak about language in a few minutes to simplify things, uh, the other under Frank Barrett, which was a representative of the anti-treaty faction. Some people joined one side or the other for various reasons, in some cases uh, for ideological reasons, as we have discussed, uh, in other cases out of loyalty to commanding officers, or out of loyalty to organisations. So, for instance, Common Aman as an organisation um, adopted a, a, an anti-treaty position, or of course some individual members split from that and set up their own organisation. Uh, in other cases, they simply followed what their unit was doing, and they followed uh, the, the position being adopted by various comrades. And there were some geographic uh, divisions here. So, broadly speaking, the uh, and, and these are generalizations. Broadly speaking, the Mid Clare Brigade area, the, the Brigade area was anti treaty, and broadly speaking, East Clare was pro treaty. Um, and part of that was influenced, of course, by the influence of the senior officers in both of those areas. West Clare was, was more divided. So the, the First Western Division uh, comprised five brigades. Now, Clare itself comprised three brigades for, for most of the War of Independence, the Mid-Clare Brigade, the East Clare Brigade, and the West Clare Brigade. The First Western Division then included two additional brigades, the Southwest Galway Brigade and the South East Galway Brigade. Now, the structure of the pro-treaty side changed a few times over the coming months and years, so we're not going to get into that. We're going to concentrate instead on what the structure looked like for the anti-treaty. This was the first anti-treaty First Western division and it remained like this throughout the entirety of the Civil War. Um, uh, it would have comprised, uh, in theory, about 9,000 men at the, at the outbreak of the 
uh, at the outbreak of the civil war. Uh, now, it's, it's important to remember that even though there are large numbers, the reality is, of course, that only a very fra only a fraction of them uh, would have been either, either available to fight or in a position to fight, uh, given as well that there was a, a scarcity of arms, etc. So whilst the numbers are large, and in reality, the actual number of fighting men would have been much, much smaller. So the leadership of the First Western Division had become clear uh, by, the, by, by June and July of 1922. Now, it's important to remember as well that in terms of appointments to various positions, there was an element of confusion with regard to the, who, who was in what position and in what capacity to, to some extent, insofar as people were offered various positions on one side or the other and turned them down. Sometimes people were dismissed from positions owing to issues over their, their, their perceived loyalty. Uh, and in other cases, there was some speculation as to the degree to which certain officers uh, were actually committed to one side or the other, as the civil, as in particular in the opening weeks of the Civil War. Um, and there was a reluctance, of course, to take up arms against former comrades. In many other cases, of course, people remain neutral, they said, out of the conflict entirely and for very understandable reasons. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the uh, trauma that there must have been experienced by many, many people being forced to take uh, to take sides uh, one way or another. What the the senior uh, leadership of the First Western Division uh, in July uh, 1922 was clear, uh, and the OC was Frank Barrett. Now I'm not going to go through. All of these in detail. I'm going to concentrate on a few of these leaders only, just to give us a, a thumbnail picture, I suppose, of some of the characters involved. So Frank Barrett himself was the OC of the First Western Division anti treaty uh, He uh, had been the OC of the Mid Clare Brigade, Brigade, a very prominent Republican. He died young, actually, a, a number of years after the Civil War. Uh, I'm very grateful as well to uh, my colleague in the Mid Clare Brigade. Commemoration Committee, Pat Kirby, for some of these photographs. And Pat, of course, is an excellent biographer uh, of the senior leadership uh, and others in the mid clare Brigade in particular. Uh, so, um, Padre O'Loughlin was the adjutant. Uh, Padre O'Loughlin was from Kilfenora. He had been a quartermaster of the mid clare Brigade. He later became vice, uh, 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 vice a commandant or vice OC of the mid clare Brigade uh, following the the uh, shooting of Martin and Devitt. Uh, and uh, Padre Lachlan died, in fact, very young. He died at the age of 27 years of age, only a few weeks after the events that I'm going to be describing here today in August of 1922. The deputy adjutant was Sean Casey. Sean Casey succeeded uh, uh, Padre Lachlan in August of 1922 as adjutant. Sean Casey was from Rouen. He was a teacher by profession. He had been the OC of the 3rd Battalion of the Mid Clare Brigade during the War of Independence, owing to the position he adopted in the, uh, in the Civil War. He lost his teaching position. He had to emigrate to America and lived the rest of his life in Chicago. It's worth mentioning that uh, the role of an adjutant, uh, just to briefly explain that, the adjutant really, for all intents and purposes, is the second most important person in the military unit in the IRA. He is the person responsible for much of the day-to-day -day operation of the unit, unit, and in particular, matters in relation to the men themselves, in relation to personnel. The quartermaster was John Minahan. John Minahan was a, uh, a native of Corrafin. He had been the adjutant of the 3rd Battalion of the mid clare Brigade. He was a member of the active service unit. He was also both intelligence officer, the 3rd Battalion, and special intelligence officer to the brigade and uh, GHQ. Uh, and that role uh, got the British Army secret code for Michael Collins in, uh, during the truce period uh, in, uh, in 1921. Um, the quartermaster in uh, he, John Minan had been offered the position as well of adjutant of the Crow Treaty Free State uh, First Western Division, but he turned down that position to accept the position of quartermaster on the entry treaty side. Quartermaster, in effect, is responsible for barracks and uh, and facilities and and physical matters, if you like, within the military unit. Joseph Barrett was OC of operations. 
Joseph Barrett had been OC of operations in the mid Clare Brigade. He was head of the active service unit of the mid Clare Brigade. He was also head of the active service unit here and, uh, and operations for the 1st Western Division, uh, a brother of uh, a brother of Frank Barrett, uh, and of course the entire Barrett family, uh, extremely prominent during this period. I'm just going to mention as well Sean O'Grady. Uh, Sean O'Grady was in charge of police for the 1st Western Division. Now, this is a more important position than you might, than it might imply, because you didn't have an effective police force in Ireland at this stage. Of course, the role of the RIC had become defunct. The British Army uh, uh, had withdrawn from Ireland. Uh, and the maintenance of law and order had fallen essentially to the IRA in whatever area they, they happened to be, the, of the officers happened to be in charge of. Uh, and so Sean O'Grady was in charge of that. Sean O'Grady was from Trasheen, uh, and he later went on to, he was later a TD and he became a parliamentary uh, secretary. So, and there were, of course, other senior officers, uh, such as Stephen Madigan as well, who was in charge of, of intelligence. Now, uh, I want to speak briefly about the occupation of barracks. So, immediately upon the ratification of the treaty with the House of Commons of Southern Ireland uh, in 1922, the British Army began to withdraw from barracks uh, and the RIC from barracks right across, uh, right across Ireland. Uh, they withdrew very quickly and they did so for two reasons. The first is that they viewed that their ongoing presence might be a form of provocation because, of course, the situation was still extremely volatile and they wanted to leave it to, largely speaking, to the Irish to sort these issues out for themselves. The second was that they needed troops for Palestine, where things were kicking off at that stage for the Palestinian Palestine mandate. Uh, and so they, many of these troops that had been in Ireland uh, got rewarded by being sent to another combat zone in Palestine. So the picture here on the right is Lord French um, uh, inspecting troops under withdrawal from Victoria Barracks, now Collins Barracks in Cork. Not all uh, withdrawals would have been as impressive as this, uh, and there would have been a very large number of them occurring uh, right across February, March uh, and April uh, in uh, small and large barracks, as I said, right across Clare. And by mid-May, this withdrawal had been fully completed. Now, it's also fair to say that these uh, withdrawals from barracks didn't always go smoothly. And um, so, for instance, when uh, the IRA officers uh, in, uh, when the IRA officers in Milton Malbay uh, went to take over possession of that barracks. Uh, a, a number of school children had started to jeer the RIC men uh, and police stationed in that barracks, uh, with the consequence that uh, two Mills bombs, in fact, had, were thrown into those school children, two of them, a boy of 14 uh, and a, uh, another a boy of 15, uh, were badly injured in actual fact. And so were a number of young school, uh, number of young school children. Uh, the IRA men went to assist those children. They ensured that they were brought to hospital to hospital to be treated. Um, and um, uh, uh, and apologies, this occurred in Ennis time, when not in Milton Malve. Uh, and um, uh, when um, when they returned then to take control of the barracks, they were in fact fired on uh, by a number of the RIC men. Uh, so again, these type of incidents occurred. Um, the practice was to allow uh, the local IRA to take possession of the barracks. So the, the government, uh, the provisional government were maintaining a fiction that uh, in actual fact, there was one army that, was all, one, that there wasn't a split in reality. They allowed the local uh, IRA to take over the barracks regardless of the attitude of the officers for that local unit. Uh, and Richard Mackay outlined in a debate in the Dáil in April uh, how, how uh, the importance of this particular way of, of dealing with the issue. Uh, and uh, this as well didn't always go according to plan. And in fact, in June 1922, Michael Brennan was forced to withdraw uh, troops from a number of towns and villages in Clare. Uh, so what he did was uh, in May and June, he decided to occupy other facilities within Towns such as Milton, Malby, and Astyme and Liscanor, and Liston, Varna, Kilkey, and Kilrush, where the anti treaty forces had already occupied the main barracks. So there were two parallel occupation forces of barracks uh, in these towns. Uh, the um, army executive in the four courts 
made an official complaint to the provisional government that this was in breach of truce and inverted commas that had been reached between the parties to facilitate the elections that were held in 1922, that it was in breach of that, uh, and the provisional government um, instructed uh, Michael Brennan to withdraw troops from those areas. Uh, had he not done so, of course, this it was a provocation and could have resulted in the civil war starting in Clare and not in the four courts in Dublin. So I just want to speak about the wider context of the civil war at this time. And I want to start by, by um, speaking about language. So um, the civil war began on 28th of June, 1922, with the shelling of the four courts. And uh, from this point on, uh, I'm, I'm going to simplify language. I'm going to talk about pro-treaty side as being the free state army, who are also, they like to call themselves the national army, sometimes called the regulars, but we're going to call them the free state army, and we're going to refer to the anti-treaty forces as the IRA, who are often referred to as the Republicans, and of course the free state army themselves referred to them as the irregulars, which would not have called them the irregulars to their face, it was not a title that they accepted. So we're going to refer to the free state as the pro-treaty army, and we're going to refer to the IRA as the anti-treaty uh, anti -treaty army. <clears throat> it is of course just a technical point to note that even though we're calling them the Free State Army and they were called that at the time, the Irish Free State did not actually, was not actually in existence in July 1922. It was not going to come into existence until December of 1922. There was a period of 12 months allowed uh, during which there was a provisional government appointed uh, to run the country and that provisional government was provided for under the treaty. Uh, so the Free State did not come into existence until December of 1922. We're still calling it the Free State Army. So the uh, the civil war erupted in Dublin with the shelling of the four courts. Uh, the army, the, the Free State Army, used artillery, eighteen pounder guns, field guns that had been uh, lent or given to them by the British Army for those pur for those purposes. And uh, the uh, uh, IRA leadership. Um, withdrew from the four courts. There was some fighting around an area, an area that was known as the block in Dublin. And ultimately, the bulk of the fighting moved. And Liam Lynch, chief of staff of the IRA at this point, uh, moved the headquarters of the IRA to Limerick. And fierce fighting erupted in, in Limerick in July of 1922, the, the most fierce fighting, not just of, uh, of uh, the Civil War, but of either the Civil War or the War of Independence, occurred in Limerick. And the IRA had taken up a number of defensive positions in that city. And the strategic objective of Liam Lynch was to maintain a territorial area uh, um, south and west of a line drawn from Limerick as far as Waterford. And this was colloquially, though not officially, known as uh, the Munster Republic. And uh, once Limerick fell, as July wore on, uh, that fighting moved towards what's called the Kilmallock Triangle, an area around Kilmallock, Brough, and Rory. And significant number of troops were involved in this fighting. On both sides, troops were brought from Dublin or that, uh, and from Kilkenny, and troops were also brought from Kerry and from, from the south on the Republican side. So the role of Clare during this period of the First Western Division was to protect the western flank of, uh, uh, of Liam Lynch's army fighting in Limerick, and uh, they did so, and we're going to speak about this in more detail in a minute, through the destruction of infrastructure around Clare. Now, I'm now going to turn just to what was happening in Clare. At, that was what was happening in Limerick about this time. I'm going to turn to what was happening in Clare about this time. And this is the beautiful town of Ennis. And uh, various barracks had been occupied across Clare by both the, by the IRA, pro, pro and anti-treaty IRA, Broadly speaking, most of the barracks in mid Clare were occupied by the pro, by the pro treaty, by the anti treaty uh, IRA, and in the East Clare area by the Free State Army or the pro treaty IRA. The Free State uh, uh, positioned their headquarters in Ennis, in this building just at the bottom of your screen, which is now the Rowan Tree. At the time, it was called the County Club House, and thus the Club Bridge is called the Club Bridge today. So they occupied that position and they heavily fortified it. Because Ennis is in the, the Mid Clare Brigade area, uh, the, local, uh, the local IRA, if you like, and in inverted commas, uh, occupied the main barracks, which was the RIC barracks in Ennis. And that's that building in the middle of your screen, the old building there just in front of the courthouse. 
they occupied there. They also occupied some other buildings such as the Masonic Lodge and Howard's house, which is that impressive house that we can see uh, there just in front of the RIC barracks. The, the, anti the three state also occupied the courthouse. We can see the courthouse in the background in the last shot, and we can see uh, the degree to which the courthouse has an excellent view of the RIC barracks from here, uh, of the anti position. And the Free State also occupied this blue building here, which we can see, which was called the Ordnance House at the time. It had been in possession of the British Army during the First World War. They had um, positions of refugees there. It was also uh, a training school for officers of the IRA, again, the combined unified IRA in January of 1922. So many of the, many of the officers fighting here uh, in the Civil War would have trained in this building during January of 1922. So we can see that in effect, uh, the uh, RIC barracks, uh, the ex-RIC barracks, the headquarters of the anti-treaty IRA was surrounded on three sides as was described in, uh, as was described in one of the newspapers uh, by a triangle, by positions occupied uh, by, the, uh, by the Free State Army. On the 1st of July, 19, uh, on the 1st of July, uh, 1922, the Free State Troops also took over some other buildings. Uh, uh, solicitor's office, a building owned by a solicitor by the name of um, Hunt. And they um, took to get better firing positions and they started to menace, for want of a better word, the position being occupied by the anti by the anti-treaty forces in the RIC barracks. The IRA deeming their position to be very difficult uh, throughout the first of July started to withdraw uh, their arsenal. It, their, their main arsenal was being held here. They started to withdraw their arsenal from this barracks. Uh, and they did so unhindered uh, by the free state forces that were surrounding them. Um, and on the night of the 1st of July, between 10 and 11 o'clock, they set this building on fire uh, and uh, they destroyed the building. Now, the destruction of buildings like this, and many of many, all of these positions uh, that were occupied by the anti-treaty forces by the IRA in Clare uh, that had been occupied by them during the spring of 1922 were ultimately evacuated by them during July of 1922 and all or the vast majority of them would have been destroyed to varying degrees by them. This was fairly standard military practice that when you were withdrawing from uh, a fortified position that you did not allow that to fall into the hands of your enemy uh, in a way in which you might need to have to retake possession of it at some stage in the future. So the RSC barracks in Ennis was no different. So they withdrew their arsenal uh, to Curafin. To and this is the equally uh, beautiful village of Curafin. This is the road into Curafin from Ennis, across that bridge up the main street. Curafin had been uh, one of the main strongholds of the RIC and the British Army during uh, the uh, during the War of Independence. And the RIC had withdrawn from small barracks across Clare and across Ireland to a number of larger barracks as the war progressed. Uh, and uh, they would have concentrated their forces in those barracks. So the barracks in Corrifin, the RIC barracks in Corrifin, which was, is beside the Catholic Church in Corrifin, that uh, had, had, um, was occupied by about 40 RIC men during the War of Independence. That was occupied by the IRA during uh, during, the, during, the la, during the spring of 1920 by the anti-treaty IRA. Um, and uh, it was heavily fortified. And we're going to see an example of some of these fortifications in a minute, an illustrated example of it. The other significant building that was in Curafin at this time was the workhouse. Uh, this was the Union Workhouse that had been opened in, 19, in 1853. So it was a relatively new building as workhouses go. It was an enormous building that covered 12 acres. So that workhouse, what's remaining of that workhouse is essentially here, if you can see my cursor, this building here in the front with the green door in it, this would have been the entrance to it. But the workhouse covered most of this area here, this housing estate here, as I said, about 12 acres. Uh, and it was a very substantial building. It could house 500 residents. Um, and it had been occupied by the second battalion, Royal Scots, during the War of Independence. Uh, and later by G Company of the Auxiliaries during the truce, during the truce period. Uh, and it had significant fortifications that had been fortified by the British. And uh, one presumes many of those, 
much of that would have been left behind them when they were when they were um, withdrawing from Ireland. So the the IRA moved their arsenal to this workhouse in Corrifin. Now they would have chosen Corrifin for a number of reasons. First of all, the workhouse was a substantial building. Uh, secondly, it was very well fortified, as I've said. Currently, Corrifin was in an ideal position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the division. You've seen a map of the division. Corrifin would have been as close as you can get to being in the center of that division. It gave uh, very good opportunities for communication by dispatch rider for the various other brigades, five brigades, both in Galway and in the rest of Clare. And in that regard, in fact, was uh, much better positioned than, than what, have, what would have been the position in Ennis. So in addition to moving their arsenal here, they also moved their center of operations here. Now, at this time, the official headquarters of the anti-treaty IRA was a house in Edenvale. But as the uh, month went on, uh, the, head, the uh, union workhouse in Corrigan also became the also became the official headquarters of the 1st Western Division. So we can here so see some pictures of the Union Workhouse in Curriculum. These are the only three remaining uh, photographs that we, that we know of, but you can see what a substantial building it was. The building on the bottom left here, you can see the main block of the Union Workhouse. Uh, the bit to the right of that is what we saw in the video earlier. It's the only part of it that remains. It became a courthouse for a period of time. Um, and the picture up on, in the middle, the two pictures in the middle, one shows, of course, the layout of the workhouse. The one to the right of that um, shows the, the um, what the workhouse looked from as photographed from an area called Clean, which is at the other side of Loch Atadon Lake. That's a lake there on the bottom of the picture. And that's going to become relevant uh, later on when we speak about the evacuation of the workhouse. So suffice it to say, a very significant building. So they... IRA heavily fortified the building, and here is just a report from the Saturday Record. Now, reports on the activities of the anti-treaty IRA uh, were fairly scarce uh, in detail in the newspapers, because, of course, the newspapers were heavily, uh, were, were heavily censored at this time. Uh, so we don't tend to get an awful lot of detail, so you have to take what you can from the detail you're given. Now, uh, Seamus McArdle, who is a very talented illustrationist from uh, County Louth, he did some of these illustrations uh, for me to give some feeling of what this might have looked like. The fortifications that are shown here uh, are not that as fanciful as you might think, actually. We, this is based on uh, some limited um, photographs of fortified positions from the time in Ireland, the way in which it would have been fortified by the RIC. I'm not saying that this is exactly how Curzon would have looked. There probably wouldn't have been as many rifles. But this type of uh, metal shuttering was a form of fortification used, and sandbags, of course, were a common one, as would have been other forms of, uh, of uh, defensive material, such as planks of wood and barrels and that type of thing. So uh, it might be an exaggerated form of, of the truth, but nonetheless, I think, is, uh, is reasonably indicative of what fortifications might have looked like at the time. And again, here, the Saturday Record reporting that the Republicans have taken over Corrifin workhouse in which they have concentrated a large number of their forces, stores, and other equipment. They have the building strongly fortified. So a key part of the role of uh, the IRA and the 1st Western Division at this time, as I've alluded to, would have been the destruction of infrastructure. So the anti-treaty IRA were fighting in effect a defensive war. So they were uh, seeking to retain this monster republic. And they were seeking to retain the Munster Republic for long enough to prevent the free state from coming into existence in December, and in so doing, to seek to renegotiate the treaty. So that was the strategic objective. So part of the tactical aspects of that were the destruction of infrastructure. And this would prevent the movement of, uh, of free state troops uh, important in a, in a defensive situation. Now, and very importantly, to prevent the movement of vehicular traffic, so vehicular traffic of a particular kind was a key advantage that the Free State had over the anti-treaty forces. They didn't have numeric superiority at this point in the Civil War, at the Civil War, but they did have superiority in term, terms of equipment. And importantly, they had more armored cars, and importantly, they had artillery, which uh, the, the anti-treaty IRA did not have. So the IRA engaged in a very significant campaign, a campaign of the destruction of infrastructure involved the destruction of bridges, the rendering roads impassable, 
the destruction or damaging of railway lines, uh, the cutting of telecommunications equipment and telegraph uh, communications. And they succeeded during these weeks and months in cutting off, in, by July 1922, cutting off most of the towns in Clare from communication with each other or with the outside world, for want of a better word. And we have newspaper reports at the time of the extent to which Ennis and other towns were cut off from the connectivity with Limerick, Cork and with Dublin and the effect that that was having on trade and the fact that even newspapers weren't getting through, for instance. <clears throat> so um, the, it, it, a significant amount of this would have occurred around the Corrifin area as well during this period. So Liam Lynch was clearly happy with the work that was done by the 1st Western Division. Uh, this is a uh, report um, uh, and uh, this report is, is taken from Toomey Archives and UCD. Um, and uh, he's stating here in, in a communication a dispatch to uh, the Director of Operations at Limerick that the reports from the 1st Western Division are satisfactory. It is reassuring that to learn artillery from Athlone cannot pass through this area and that rail and road communications have been absolutely destroyed. So what were some of the activities that were happening in Corfin at this time? Now, in order to determine this, we have to rely on uh, uh, the reports of a number of individuals. Uh, one of them was John Minahan, who was the quartermaster stationed at Corfin. We're also relying on captured dispatches. And these captured dispatches are retained in the National Archives. And in particular, there are dispatches, uh, there are some uh, in particular the dispatches between the 4th Battalion uh, uh, of the Mittler Brigade and uh, the Corrifin Workhouse. Now, it's important to point out that in addition to being the headquarters of the 1st Western Division, the Corrifin Workhouse at this stage also became uh, the, the headquarters of the, uh, the Mittler Brigade itself, which was a constituent brigade within the 1st Western Division. Uh, and uh, Sean O'Keefe was, uh, was the OC of the Midclare Brigade. So we have those captured dispatches and that gives some insight into what was going on in Corrifin at the time and other captured documents, uh, again, from the military archives. But we can determine a number of things. We can say that there was a significant concentration of troops. We can say the troops came there from across the division. And again, about this time, they, the IRA were withdrawing from RIC and other barracks and other towns and villages and destroying those. And they would have uh, presumably some more or all of them would have uh, would have withdrawn to Corrifin. But we also know that men arrived there to support activities from other divisions. We know that there was significant activity around engineering and supplies. We know that it was the centre of operations of the 1st Western Division and the centre of operations of the active service unit. So we have, uh, again, captured documents and other statements, um, including the captured diary of a particular uh, IRA volunteer indicating that they had left Corrifin to engage in various active service uh, actions and activities. And we also know that it was the centre of a significant communications hub for dispatch riders right across the division. So we'll get into that in a little bit more detail now. Um, so as you were approaching Corrifin in July of 1922, you would have been under no illusion that you were entering uh, a heavily militarised area. Uh, we know that roads were blocked and bridges were blown. And uh, the Clare Champion here is stating bridges in Corrifin have been destroyed. Uh, barricades were erected at Craigmore Cross. Uh, there's uh, further recounting of, of what these, some of these barricades looked like. And we know, for instance, that they would have left a gap at the side to allow for pedestrian uh, traffic, which, which uh, might have been subject to checkpoint, but that they would have been preventing vehicular traffic from passing, other than, of course, occasions when the vehicular traffic would have been their own. Um, so, uh, again, in terms of captured documents, this is a dispatch from Seamus Hennessy, and Seamus Hennessy is depicted here on the right. This photograph, in fact, was taken, as I understand it, in August 1922, so it's quite contemporary. Seamus Hennessy was the OC of the 4th Battalion of the, of the Mictair Brigade. He had taken over from a man by the name of Ignatius O'Neill, who had resigned. And Seamus was sending uh, uh, dispatches to which were captured and intercepted to Sean O'Keefe. Sean O'Keefe had been quartermaster of the uh, Mid-Clare Brigade and in the Civil War, he succeeded Frank Barrett as OC of the Mid-Clare Brigade. 
so it, this is just these. I'm just going to use some extracts from some of these uh, these just dispatches to to I suppose give an insight of what was going on. So he's, he points out here uh, that I also sent seven men from here last Saturday to report for duty in Corfin, but some of them kicked up on the road when one of our own officers was not with them, with the result of none of them, with the result that none of them did get to Corfin. So this uh, indicates, I suppose, gives an indication of perhaps some of the challenges experienced by senior officers in 1922, uh, whereby there was a reluctance perhaps on the part of some of the men uh, to engage uh, in active service uh, in a civil war scenario, which they would have seen as being very different to active service or to uh, fighting or to reporting for duty uh, in the circumstances of the War of Independence. Uh, so here's an example of where they weren't always happy, for instance, sent to Corfin to report for duty, and in fact, didn't report for duty in Corfin. So John Minahan, who was the quartermaster, um, gives us some further insight into what was going on. Now, he's, he, this is where he is speaking about uh, this period of July. He's speaking specifically about this period of July 1922 what was going on in this period. In some cases, he's explicit that these things were happening in Corifin. In other cases, he is not explicit, but I think we can assume that it's reasonable to assume that these activities were happening at Corifin or were happening at Corifin to some degree. So he stated that the, the division secured from general headquarters, uh, three competent men from Kerry, two named O'Connors and one Jerry Casey from Castle Island, and one man from Limerick, Frank Murphy, now, we know that Frank Murphy was an expert in machine gun operations to train a number of men from each brigade in engineering and munitions. Uh, he does not say this training was happening at Corifin. The context in which he is saying this implies that it was happening in Corifin, or I think it's reasonable to assume that a certain element of it was happening at Corifin, or clearly they may have traveled to other brigades around the division to engage in this activity as well. Uh, he also states that the following special services were present at the divisional headquarters in Corifin, munitions, engineering, medical services, transport and supplies. So they're all significant areas. So again, gives an indication of uh, the, the breadth of activity that was happening there at this time. Seamus Hennessy, again, in a capture dispatch to, uh, in a capture dispatch to um, uh, um, Sean O'Keefe states, we got a good share of stuff in Milltown at the chemists and hardware shops for the engineering department. We also raided the Milltown railway station a few nights ago, but we did not get much of any importance there. I have arranged to get it all sent on to Corifin on tomorrow, Saturday. So he's clear there was an engineering department backing up what John Minahan is saying, present at Corifin that was engaged in some uh, significant engineering activity. John Minahan further goes on to state the type of activities that were happening in July 1922. Again, that stating was happening spe specifically in Corifin, but I think it's implied clearly that it was, um, uh, because all of this has been spoken about prior to when speaking about the destruction of the workhouse itself. So he's saying the manufacture of the munitions, uh, the making and filling of landmines, the filling of bombs, the armoring of a 60 to 80 horsepower Vauxhall, the requisitioning of a brass gun to be used electronically, repair of firearms, manufacture of shells for guns, use and laying of field telephones. Uh, so again, this depiction of what the armoring of uh, this car might have looked like. Um, and uh, again, of course, the, the um, IRA uh, would have been at a significant disadvantage with regard to some of that type of heavy vehicular trip, uh, um, machine equipment that would have been readily available to the Free State Army. We're not certain on what senior officers would have been present at Corifin, but there are four we know were present, either because the TELUS were there or because we have correspondence to them or from them. One is Frank Barrett, the OC, uh, well, one is Padre Lachlan, one is John Minahan, and one is uh, William Shannon. And uh, they're, they're, I think it's reasonable to assume that other senior officers were probably present. And the reason that I'm saying that is because there were, this, at this time, there were challenges already with communications. It wasn't that easy. You couldn't just ring somebody up and give them orders. You had to send a dispatch rider uh, with the orders, in particular in circumstances where telegraph lines, etc., had been destroyed by the IRA themselves. So it would have been inconvenient to have your senior officers, staff officers, uh, too widely dispersed. So I think it's likely that Frank Barrett would have wanted to have them present. Uh, the second is the, the is 
is that we have a lack of dispatches to those senior officers. We do have one to the vice OC, but other than that, we do not, so we know he may not have been there, but we do not have others. So this implies that many of them would have been present at Corrifin, where we do have dispatches, for instance, to the OCs of the various brigades, who of course would have been expected, or adjutants of other brigades, who would have been expected to be in their brigade area, looking after matters locally there. The third uh, reason why I believe a number of these senior officers were present in Corrifin is because of a, um, an intelligence report that was sent by uh, the Director of Intelligence um, at GHQ of, of, the, um, of the IRA to Liam Lynch. Uh, and this, uh, this was sent to him following the withdrawal from Corrifin by the IRA. Uh, and again, he is stating here uh, that on the 26th of July, the night after uh, the destruction of the workhouse at Corrifin, the Free State Army raided the John Minahan's house, the quartermaster at Corrifin, uh, and that the raiding party were looking for divisional, they were shouting out the names of and looking for members of the divisional staff searching the rooms for them. So we know that at a minimum, the Free State Army believed that some more or all of the the divisional staff of the IRA were present at Corrifin about that time. So <clears throat> Corrifin would have been the, uh, the hub of uh, a communications network across the First Western Division, and communications at this time would have been done by dispatch rider, and dispatch riders were typically on motorcycle, but they may also have been on bicycle, depending on the urgency of the communication and the practicalities at the time. So, for example, and then again, this is based on captured documents uh, stored at the military archives. On the 19th of July, we know that 13 dispatches were sent from Corrifin and five were received. Uh, examples of some of these dispatches are a dispatch to the OC of the 2nd Western Division, which would have been north of in roughly the North Galway area. This was sent by motorcycle via Canvara. So now when we say via Canvara, we mean that a dispatch rider on motorcycle left from Corrifin, who traveled to Canvara, and then another dispatch rider would have taken up that dispatch in Canvara and would have brought it further along the dispatch route. He might have brought it directly to the headquarters of the 2nd Western Division, or he may have brought it to another dispatch post where another rider would have taken it from there. So you had these relay system, and we'll, we'll come across that again in a few minutes. The dispatch rider here was S. Hillary. I have searched and attempted to find anyone in the nominal roles named S. Hillary. I, I have not found such a person, uh, but he is recorded as being the dispatch rider here. Um, dispatchers were sent to each of the brigade OCs in the southeast and southwest Galway. Again, this time they were sent via GART. So again, the dispatch rider, instead of going to Canberra, would have gone to GART. And from there, someone else would have taken up the, the dispatch from there. Again, by motorcycle, dispatchers were sent to the 2nd Western Division and Southwest Galway Brigades uh, marked very urgent and important communication, the content of it we don't know. And there were also incoming dispatches received from other divisions, from other brigades, and from GHQ. So to give an example, when we look at these dispatches, it gives us an example of some of the matters that were occupying the attention of the, uh, of the headquarters of the 1st Western Division at Corrifin about this time. So um, again, this is, this is a communication, a dispatch from the communications department, marked headquarters, 1st Western Division, Corrifin IRA barracks to the, to the adjutant of the East Clare Brigade. And uh, uh, again, it reads as follows, with reference to my communication with the opening of a line of communication to the 3rd Southern Division. Uh, this would have been uh, east of Limerick, via Crushy and Tuller, Broadford and O'Brien's Bridge, I've not yet received any report as to what you have done on the matter. You will let me have the details asked for per return. In fixing those posts, you will not lose sight of the usefulness of girls and Boy Scouts. So very often, again, Dean Aaron and Common Aman and various other organizations were uh, heavily involved in this form of communication and dispatch riding. Um, a line is also to be opened up between divisional headquarters of Limerick, the Crosheen, Tuller, Broadford, Tonlara. So when he's naming these areas, he means these were the dispatch posts. So a dispatcher would have gone, uh, would have gone to Limerick via by Crosheen, another one had gone from there to Tuller to Broadford to Tonlara. He would accordingly make the necessary arrangements for a post to Tonlara. Um, the 
connection uh, in Limerick City is Dr. Mae Maloney, South the county in the firm of Limerick. If you were to give very careful attention to that portion of those lines of communication which passes through your area is in the event of the enemy interrupting our present line, we have no alternative route and are consequently cut off from GHQ. And I remember GHQ at this stage was in Limerick and then later moved to Clanmel as, uh, as the month progressed. So these, this, this was where they were um, anxious to maintain communication with that GHQ uh, where Liam Lynch was, was stationed. Further the dispatches, so dispatch here to Miss Hogan. Admittedly, we'd have to say the tone of this particular dispatch is somewhat different to the one sent to the adjutant of the East Care Brigade. It's absolutely essential that a line of communication between here and Limerick City be opened up immediately. I would be very much obliged that you would make some permanent arrangement to Cratlow for forwarding dispatches to Limerick from this side and to the market and Fergus from the other. I've written Michael Murray at Newmarket to establish a post at his place to get into touch, in, in touch with you so that you can work in conjunction with him. The place of call at Limerick is Dr. May Maloney, County Infirmary. Please give this matter your immediate attention and let me know what arrangements you have made with Misha Dakara. Now, interestingly, uh, uh, Ms. Hogan uh, either didn't apply for a pension uh, or died prior to 1935 because there's no record of her in the pension nominal roles. There is another Ms. Hogan in Newmarket and Fergus who in fact references this Ms. Hogan as being someone for whom she worked uh, as a member coming a man and saying that she was uh, the, if not one, or, or a one of, if not the contact person in Newmarket and Fergus or these contacts, uh, she didn't get a pension um, as it turns out. So as I've said earlier, it was also the headquarters of the Midterm Brigade and a captured document here uh, usefully points out to the Free State Army who the officers were, they probably would have known it anyway, all of these people were well known to each other, they all fought with each other um, as comrades during the War of Independence. So Sean O'Keefe was the OC, uh, P. McMahon, Vice OC JJ Clahassey was the adjutant, P. McNamara the quartermaster and Con McMahon that uh, was the intelligence officer. So we have um, uh, dispatches, as I've said already, between uh, the 4th Battalion, again, because they were the ones that were captured, and Sean O'Keefe. And I just want to touch on a number of these because they give a good insight into some aspects of what was happening in Fair about this time uh, in July 1922. Uh, so here, Seamus Hennessy is telling Sean O'Keefe that I had a small party of ASU Active Service Unit to find Collium, in other words, of the of this battalion, 4th Battalion, having a position taken opposite a trench in the road from Ina to Ennestyman a few days ago. So they would have dug a trench in the road uh, to stop or slow down vehicular traffic to ambush it. Uh, just as the car came on the trench, Ignatius O'Neill came off the car. So any of them uh, did not fire. As I will tell you the truth, they find it hard to fire an Ignatius or Tasser. Now Ignatius O'Neill was his predecessor as the OC of the 4th Battalion. Uh, and in fact, he had been the mastermind of uh, the Renin ambush. Um, he resigned not long after the Renin ambush arising from a disagreement with his superior officers. Tasser uh, is Tasser, uh, Tasser Nealon, uh, and Tasser Nealon was the vice OC of the 4th Battalion. He also resigned with Ignatius O'Neill at that time. Seamus Hennessy would have taken over then from Ignatius O'Neill and uh, Anthony Maloney, who we'll see in a minute, would have taken over from Tasser. So we can see here that. In the context of a civil war, many of these, uh, the ordinary rank and file of the IRA found it difficult to fire on their former comrades, and in particular, the former commanding officers. That's an interesting insight. Um, the other, in another dispatch, uh, he, again, Seamus Hennessy implies that there were prisoners held at Currafin. And if there weren't prisoners held at Currafin, that prisoners might have been held at Currafin at some stage in the future. So he states, kindly let me know. So he, he tells Sean O'Keefe about prisoners, officers that they had that they had captured and one of them and one of the people he refers to was in fact uh commandant trolley who was of the free state army and um this gives an i, I haven't detailed it here but is the way in which he discusses trolley is also interesting because he does say that they were on he implies that they were uncertain as to what side on what side trolley's true loyalties lay and that he believed actually up to a point that trolley was doing all he could for them all he could for in other words, the anti-treaty IRA in Milltown. And, uh, but they, they were disabused of that view ultimately as the month wore on uh, and they moved against Crawley and they arrested a number of officers. So, and he tells John O'Keefe about this. 
Then he asked, kindly, kindly, kindly let me know by return where these prisoners are to be sent to, or will I send them to Corfin directly? So again, implying that prisoners may have been held at Corfin at that time, or that they were contemplating holding prisoners at Corfin at that time. Um, another dispatch that I'm going to speak about, because it gives another good insight into, um, again, what life was like in Clare in July 1922. And this is from Anthony Malone. I mentioned to him already. He was a vice uh, commandant of the 4th Battalion. And he here is writing uh, not to uh, Sean O'Keefe, but to Frank Barrett directly. And that's indicating the uh, importance, I suppose, of which viewed some of the matters that he was bringing to his attention. And he, I'm just going to extract some elements of his, uh, of his dispatch. He states that a man named John O'Connor from the Moy uh, area, that's not far from the Hinch, was shot there this morning near his own place by two men wearing trench coats. He was connected in a farm dispute lately. He goes on to say the Protestant church in Milltown was burned down sometime late last night. This is the third case of burning of private property within the parish since June 29th. It is the common belief of the public that the IRA are responsible for these outrages. I want to know can anything be done whereby these false reports concerning the IRA can be repudiated. Now we know from uh, this communications like this, this dispatch and but other newspaper reports at that time are filled with outrages that were happening across Clare and indeed across Ireland. And what was happening here is that uh, ordinary citizens were taking advantage of the uh, turmoil in Ireland, uh, in particular uh, 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 during the Civil War, in order to either settle scores or seek to resolve disputes through violence. And some of these related to land disputes between individuals. And in fact, in about this time as well, in Curthin, uh, a, a man was shot in the parish of Ra while he was standing in his field, he was shot at distance by a rifle. Uh, and again, it was in relation to a, um, a land dispute. So people engaged in murder at this time arising from uh, various disputes. They also engaged in the destruction of buildings, etc. Uh, again, relating to private disputes. Uh, they were taking advantage of the fact that there wasn't a, uh, that the, you know, that the RIC no, were no longer policing such matters. Uh, the policing of this was left to the IRA and they, they did investigate many of these and they sought to, to address them and to bring people to justice. But of course, they had other things to think about, such as fighting a civil war at the time. Um, and there was an incident as well about this time during the occupation of the workhouse at Corrifin, when a building and premises and um, business on Main Street in Corrifin was burnt down. Uh, people, it was applied that the IRA had done this. Uh, it, this, in fact, prompted the owner of that building to write a letter which was published in, in the newspapers, uh, making it clear that the IRA had nothing to do with it. And in actual fact, the IRA had come to his assistance uh, and it helped to put out the flames, etc. So again, uh, these were private disputes uh, in the context of a large element of lawlessness in Ireland at the time, where people who were taking advantage of the circumstances and seek to blame this uh, on the IRA or otherwise just simply uh, rely on, on the improbability of the, of the of them being detected for it. So um, I want to now turn to the evacuation of Corrafin. So um, the um, by the 25th of July, uh, the area had been very heavily fortified, and we have a report here, two reports here uh, from the uh, Clare Champion from the Saturday Record. The Clare Champion points out that on the 25th of July, business uh, is at a standstill here. This is Corrifin. All roads in the vicinity of the town have been, block have been blockaded and bridges destroyed, as a result of which they're impassable to vehicular traffic, foodstuffs are running short, and there is a danger of scarcity. And the Saturday record reports that rumours are afloat that Corrifin workhouse is to be the battleground for Clare. So what was happening at this stage is Limerick City had fallen. The first Western Division Free State Army had been heavily involved in that action at Limerick. The action had moved further east and towards Brewery, as we had discussed earlier. Elements of the Free State Army were now freed up to turn their attention to the IRA and Clare. And they, um, uh, they uh, moved troops from uh, Kilkenny into Ennis, uh, and they further uh, 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 bolstered those by further Free State troops uh, as, um, uh, as July progressed. So we have here the final dispatches that were sent uh, to uh, by the 
Workhouse and Corrifan headquarters uh, to the headquarters of uh, the IRA itself under Liam Lynch in Clamell at this stage. Now, I've just noticed these dates are wrong. It says 24th of June. That should, of course, be 24th of July and 25th of July. So the I'm just going to go through these dispatches because they show the final hours, if you like, of the workhouse in Corrifan to an extent. So on 8 p.m. on the 24th of July, uh, it states that they state about 400 Free State troops equipped with rifles and machine guns have just arrived in Ennis from Limerick and have occupied all prominent positions. Uh, they used to labour a room, Masonic Lodge, Howard's House and the County Club. Of course, they couldn't occupy the RSC barracks because that had been destroyed. They have the town surrounded and nobody is allowed out except on foot. At 11.30 p.m. Uh, on the same day, they state the Free State troops from home. Now, home here is home barracks, which was a very large barracks one well, of the largest in Ireland, in fact, positioned in the, right in the middle of Ennis. It no longer exists. That's roughly where the Jet Club would have been in the past, or Paddy Khan's nightclub. It's there, um, uh, long since destroyed. So Free State troops from the home barracks uh, reportedly reported to going to West Clare tomorrow and also going to surround Corriffin barracks tonight. On the 25th of July at 10 a.m., two important road bridges leading from Ennis to here, to here by which they mean Corrifin, were demolished last night, also one railway bridge. These road bridges are each about a quarter mile from Ennis and the railway bridge one and a half miles from Ennis. Now we know what these bridges were because they were reported as well in the newspapers. At 2.30 p.m. reported to have come from reliable source an attack is contemplated uh, on Corrifin through the Crusheen area. Uh, telephone communication between Ennis and Corrifin being repaired, so being repaired by the Free State Army to facilitate that operation. 3 p.m. up to now, no movement of, free, of troops from Ennis reported. Um, now, that is the last dispatch that we have um, from Corrifin in the records. So from here on in, I'm afraid, we do not know with certainty what happened or why uh, they chose to evacuate such a, uh, such a fort, heavily fortified position as they had occupied at Corrifin. And we have to rely on local memory from this point on, I'm afraid uh, this is not uh, written down, but local memory in Corrifin, uh, and uh, this is in fact recounted as well in Eddie Lenham's book on the West Clare Railway, uh, is that uh, intelligence had reached Corrifin uh, that the Free State were going to bring up artillery uh, to shell the position. Now this isn't surprising because the Free State had artillery in Limerick since the 11th of July, and Frank Barrett was aware of that because we had the dispatches that were sent from uh, from Limerick uh, to uh, um, to Corrifin, to Corrifin in that regard. And um, artillery was important to the Free State Army in clearing fixed positions, and it was the reason why the anti-treaty IRA couldn't maintain. It was one of the reasons they couldn't maintain fixed positions was because of the presence of artillery. There's a significant difference between resisting an infantry attack and resisting an artillery attack. And the local memory is that this artillery was to be positioned at, at the far side of Lockhead head on. This picture on the right, which I showed you earlier, shows the view from, this picture is actually taken from the far side of Lockhead head on, a place called Killeen. Um, this uh, would be a one kilometer distance from the workhouse in Corrifin. Uh, this artillery is an 18 pounder British uh, field guns. They had an effective range of 6.5 kilometers. So, from Killeen to that workhouse would have been point blank range for one of these artillery pieces. And uh, it, also the position of this gun uh, at that closest point would have been about 900 meters from the closest rail line of the West Clare Railway. I think it is inconceivable that the Free State Army would have been in position of artillery, which they were, uh, that the Free State First Western Division would have been in position, possession of artillery, which they were, and would not have used that on the anti treaties most fortified position in Clare uh, in order to avoid losing significant men in seeking to take that by an, art, by an infantry assault. Uh, so uh, I think it's reasonable to assume uh, that local memory is, is likely correct in that regard and that this was the reason for the rapid evacuation of the workhouse at Corrifin. Um, the evacuation of Corrifin featured in the report of General Ono Duffy in August, which was published on the front page of the Irish Times. So he gave a report on the front page of the Irish Times. Again, bear in mind now that the uh, newspapers at the time were essentially the propaganda tools of the Free State Army. 
uh, and of the British government were heavily censored. So he got a front page section of the Irish Times to give a report on how things had progressed, uh, how things were progressing in his area of command. And he states that Corfin, uh, the headquarters of the 1st Western Division of the Irregulars, was evacuated on our troops concentrating in Gart, Ennison and Steinman. The headquarters is now in the bleak Karen Mountains. So what he is referring to here, first of all, it was a short report. So this takes up about one third or quarter of his entire report, giving a good indication of the importance of uh, the priesthood army of the uh, of the evacuation of Corifena, how it was viewed as a, as a military success at the time. Um, and this also indicates, I suppose, where how the uh, civil war had developed by this point. So the evacuation of Corifena was really the end of the first phase, I would argue, the end of the first phase of the civil war and Clare. Uh, and it, it ended a phase in which the IRA occupied fixed positions, barracks mainly in the mid tier Brigade area, and of which Corfin was the most extensive uh, with the most sophisticated operation and the greatest concentration of men. Uh, it was the last of those to be evacuated. It was in effect the end of the IRA and Clare maintaining fixed positions. And from this point, and, and that ended in no small part because of the existence and possession by the Free State Army of Artillery. And from this point on, uh, in Clare, the Civil War reverted to the type of warfare that would have existed during this War of Independence, which was a guerrilla uh, mobile type war. And that's referenced here indeed by Ono Duffy, whereby uh, the headquarters from this point on of the First Western Division would have been more mobile uh, and, and less formal, if you like, and might have been in houses, etc., uh, and might have moved uh, fr quite frequently, too frequently, probably, probably for us to ever know uh, where it might have been at any particular point in time. So the Civil War, of course, dragged on uh, for a further nine months. It was a bitter, divisive, nasty war. Uh, it left an indelible mark on uh, the minds of all of those who participated in it. Uh, for many of them, of course, it influenced the extent to which they recounted the events of the War of Independence and the prominence or lack of that they might have given to the role of various comrades, former comrades, in, in the recounting of events of the War of Independence, because they started recounting that through the lens of the Civil War. Um, there has been some debate over the extent to which uh, and how and the nature by which we are going to mark events of the Civil War. Um, I was asked to speak and I was very proud to do so at uh, an event marking the, the destruction of the workhouse at Corifin on the eve of the 100th anniversary of it on the 24th of July last, uh, which was organised by Common Stars Dukas Corifina. And that uh, is an example of how this can be done in a very dignified way. And I think it is important that we recall these events. It's important that we mark them in a dignified way. We are now at a hundred years removed. These events were important, significant events to the people who participated in them. They were important events in our history. They're events that continue to shape our history today and the Ireland uh, in which we live. Um, so, Gaurav uh, and and um, uh, I hope that you have uh, enjoyed the last hour uh, when we have looked at uh, as was one of the most important events uh, in the history of the Civil War, uh, as far as it relates to the County Clare area, at least.